Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's edition of the TD Show. Uh, my name is Chris Bird. I'm FIDE Events Manager at US Chess, and tonight we're joined by National Tournament Director Harold Stenzel. Harold, how are you doing? Okay. Great. Uh, Harold is a National Tournament Director, FIDE International Arbiter, and I believe you're also a member of the US Chess Ethics Committee. How's, how's that work? That is correct. Uh... Bu keeping busy? Uh, yeah, the latest <laughs> is we're getting online complaints. Imagine people cheating online. Yeah, I imagine that. Uh, yeah. Harold, let's let's find out a little about you. Um, so I know you've been a, a tournament director for a while. We, you're very popular in New York area. You work a lot of CSA events. How did you get into being a, a tournament tournament director? Well, it's uh, I joined the Nassau Chess Club after I got my college degree, and uh, I was there less than a year, and I was watching the. Uh, man who was running the tournaments there who was a senior citizen and i said gee could i run one and he said run them all and here it is 44 year late 44 years later and i'm still running them all <laughs> so okay all right and uh i you know i think you're like the rest of us i think your, your tdng duties have dropped off a little bit right now uh, i yeah. don't know if you don't know uh, if you've made it into the online world yet but uh i know. have not directed an online tournament yet Okay. Uh, it cre it creates its own sort of problems, and uh, so I think there's probably going to be like every other new job. It takes a little bit of time to get used to all the tricks of the trade. Sure. I have run as either a chief, mostly chief, or as an assistant. I think I'm well over 2,000 uh, USCF rated tournaments. So it sounds like a lot, but when you spread it over 44 it. years, it's not that much. <laughs> right. Just a couple of years. All right. Yeah. Well. Anyway, let's get into tonight's topic. So, um, and it's a topic that won't come up at all, probably in online chess, because uh, because if you move a piece, um, you you can float around the screen with it until you drop it on a square. Um, so we're going to talk tonight about touch move. So this this is a uh, you know fairly simple set of rules. Uh, I think everybody, all the TDs, at least know uh, and understand what they think touch move should be and what it is. So tonight we're going to clarify a few issues. Um, Regarding touch move, uh, how to deal with those claims, how to deal with disputed claims, um, you know, we'll, we'll get into the meat of the uh, the issues uh, with Harold as our guest here, providing us with uh, some of his experience uh, uh, from over the years. I'm sure he's had one or two touch move claims. So let's let's get into the first rule uh, okay. here, real quick. And and this is not actually the the first rule that's in the rule book regarding touch move, but we're going to show it this way uh, because. Uh, of the way the rules are worded, um, the, the next rule refers back to this rule. So um, 10A talks about the adjustment of pieces. So uh, if a player who is on the move, so it's that player's move, uh, first says that they're going to uh, adjust a piece by saying Jadoub or I adjust, uh, they're, they're allowed to adjust one or more pieces onto their square. So, and it's very important that they, they announce um, that uh, adjustment to the opponent. Uh, a lot of confusion can be caused if they don't say it clearly enough. Uh, things along those lines. So um, you know we're gonna we're gonna talk about the adjustment, and then we're gonna get into the touch move rule next. So it, it this is you know this is one of the uh, contentions I think we were speaking about Harold where adjustment of pieces with people not necessarily clearly defining that they're touching, uh, you know, that they're going to uh, adjust the pieces or they don't necessarily clearly say, you know, I adjust or je do, um, you know, but it, I think sometimes it's pretty obvious that if they just nudge a piece onto the onto the square or something along those lines, but it's always better if you say uh, I adjust or je do to avoid any uh, potential confusion or, um, you know, um, complaint or uh, by by the opponent, so uh, th this is an important piece of the rule that leads us into the next one, which is the actual main uh, touch move rule ten B, uh, which says except for ten A, so except when the player has said I adjust or I should do, um, a player whose move it is deliberately touches one or more pieces in a manner that may reasonably inter be interpreted as the beginning of a move, must move or capture the first piece touched that can be moved or captured. Um, this is um, the, I mean, this is the touch move rule, right? This is this is the one that um, we need to refer to when people are making touch move uh, claims, touch move claims. And uh, Harold, how would you define as may reasonably be interpreted as the beginning of a move? I I would say when the 
fingers intentionally make contact with the first piece. And it could be the opponent's piece that you're about to capture or your own piece, which you're moving. Right. So I think this, this moves a lot of confusion out of it. If you accidentally pick up a piece, well, you, you still, that piece that you picked up, um, could still be reason, you know, is reasonably be interpreted as the beginning of a move, uh, even though you picked up the wrong piece, um, you know, um, so this is where um, sometimes accidents uh, happen. And we have a little clarification here in the next um, slide um, that, that there's a TD tip that accompanies 10B. I'm not gonna read the whole thing here, but it's talking about, uh, especially at Scholastic's event, events, be thorough when you're investigating touch move claims, uh, because you'll find that opponents often insist, you know, they insist they do not deliberately touch a piece um, you know, uh, it, after some discussion, the TD will find that some of the opponents really did physically touch the piece in a way that it appeared as if they intended to move it, like it's not an accidental touch. And so, um, you know, however, we'll explain they really intended to move another piece, uh, but it doesn't matter. So if you pick up a piece, uh, whether you intended to move it or not, uh, it doesn't matter because that picking up of a piece may reasonably be interpreted as uh, the beginning of your move so you'll have to touch that piece um, so and as it says here the TD will have to uphold the claim in this instance uh, here um, so this definitely comes in I think a lot more in kids tournaments Harold would you agree with that oh definitely and I will say that the kids have some creative definitions of accident too so uh, I think we're going to get into that on a upcoming screen though yeah and I think I've had um, so, so we've, we've, we've had uh, situations, and I think you were talking to me, um, and Ken Ballou is in the chat as well, and he's saying, it, it's right. So you get um, the kids to actually show you what they did. You know, I, I use the same methodology too. Um, you know, I ask, uh, you know, the opponent, you know, what did they do? Uh, I asked the kid himself, you know, what, what did you do? Um, and I, I really like ask him to show me, um, you know, my, my favorite story is Wayne Clark showing me the kid who, um, you know, he asked the kid, what did you do? And the kid, you know, went to pick up the piece and just slightly touched it and went and said, okay, he's like, I didn't quite see that. Show me that again. So he went to pick up the piece and he sort of slightly touched it, but hardly, hardly touched it, but just enough. And then he said, you know, I, I still didn't quite see that, you know, show me what you did. And he did it again. And Wayne just came around and said, okay, you showed me three times that you touched that piece, so you're going to have to move it. You know, it's, it's you know, you can get kids to fall into this sort of uh, thing. So it's, uh, um, you know, it, it, everyone has their methodology. I don't know what, is there any specific tricks that you use, Harold? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I do ask them to demonstrate. And uh, I'll ask each player, and especially for kids, they like to interrupt the other one and say, no, that's not really what happened. But I say, don't worry, you'll get a turn. And uh, I've had some creative explanations. Like I had a kid once, he picked up a queen, put it down, and then he said, and then I put my finger on the top of it to show I wasn't letting go. And then I will show me how you did that. And of course, when he did that, he released the piece. Right. So not only had he touched it, but he had determined the move by releasing <laughs> it on a new square. And that, that counts. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so let's just, uh, just a couple of things for those people in chat. I know there's some other questions going on here that are not necessarily related to the TD show. Uh, my usual MO here at the TD show is we deal with this particular topic. Um, so I won't answer any of these other questions uh, related to general uh, chess, what's happening in the chess world right now, what's happening with this event, that event. Uh, we are sticking to touch move uh, with the TD show. And uh, so apologies for that. And thank you, Plaster Hippie, for the raid here. So uh, you threw us another three viewers into our uh, stream here. So I'm hopefully those, those people are looking forward to learning something about being a tournament director and working uh, on touch move rules. So uh, thank you very much for joining us. Let's, let's pop over to the next uh, rule, which is uh, touching pieces of both colors. So except for 10A, which again is the adjustment rule, uh, a player on the move who deliberately touches one or more pieces of each color uh, home, who moves the player's piece and intentionally displaces an opponent's piece with it must capture the opponent's piece with that player's piece. So this means if you touch your own piece and you touch your opponent's piece, you must make that capture if you're legally able to do so. Uh, depending on the order that you do that, 
um, may depend on if you're not able to make that particular move may depend on which one gets um, the touch move so for instance if you pick up your opponent's piece first um, and then you go to capture it with a piece that cannot capture it uh, you'll actually be enforced to capture that opponent's piece with something that legally can um, uh, likewise if you move your own piece first and go to capture a piece and if that piece cannot be legally captured then you'll be enforced to move your own piece uh, as touch move if you can legally move it. Um, so I had an issue that came up in Foxwoods uh, uh, many, many moons ago, and Harold actually be, uh, had, was actually the tournament director uh, on the floor with me as well, and I had to clarify this situation with him. I had one person pick up his queen and touch the opponent's piece with the queen, uh, but he didn't touch it with his hand. Uh, and I wasn't quite... 100% certain of the rule back then, but um, Harold came over and quickly said yes. Uh, as we can see here, if you displace it with an opponent's piece, so that, that queen becomes an extension of your hand, uh, and that touch move was still in effect, and so he had to capture that piece with the queen. So, yeah, and that rule became officially part of that wording about touching with a piece was officially added with the fourth edition because that was my useful advice at the workshop that we did right before that. And that's my one contribution to that uh, rule book. Exactly. So, so yeah, I mean, so, so it happens. Uh, so just be aware of that, but um, definitely. Uh, and, and it says here, if it's impossible to establish which piece was touched first, the player's own piece shall be uh, considered the touch piece. So if, if it's a simultaneous capturing uh, somehow, you know, pon you know Pontic's Pont or something, um, then you have to move your own piece uh, if you can't work out, you know, if that capture is not legal. Uh, anymore so let's let's move on to uh, and this is rule 10 which is prior to 10 a B and C that we just went over um, so rule 10 uh, which covers this whole chapter uh, says without a neutral witness rule 10 depends on the reliability of both the claimant and the opponent uh, if they disagree then the tournament director should strongly consider denying the claim uh, in most cases by denying the claim the TD shuts the door to all false claims and upholding a false claim usually does more harm to more players than denying an accurate claim. So this is at the start of this whole chapter, but I thought it was more relevant after we discussed what touch move is. So when you get a dispute between two players, um, and you will get a dispute between two players, it happens all the time at the National Scholastics. Someone claims touch move, the other kid doesn't. You're unable to prove it. You don't have any independent witnesses uh, to prove it. You know, you, you can't 100% prove that this this player touched this piece. Then you you basically, I mean, I, I warn him and say, hey, be careful. You know, next time if you're adjusting a piece or whatever, you know, say I adjust or be careful about, you know, making sure you're going to touch a piece before you move it. Uh, but in this instance, you know, I can't prove that you actually touched that piece. So, so you, you know, you're free to make any other move. Um, you know, along those lines. Uh, Harold, how, how often do you have um, issues that you can't resolve and so you have to fall back on this? Well, this uh, I, I sometimes do, but I always look for a little bit of extra information. And sometimes it's there in the demonstration of how they touched or didn't touch or accidentally touch. And also uh, I look at score sheets and I had a case in uh, City Scholastics a couple of years ago where the girl said, oh, you touched this pawn. And he said, no, but, but I, I didn't touch that pawn at all. I moved this pawn. And then I looked quickly at the boy's score sheet and there it was clear as day. And she was only in first grade. So I don't think she's the type who was like looking over across the table to see what he wrote down. Right. And I felt that that changed the balance from the not guilty to guilty because he claimed he didn't touch it, but he wrote it down and he hadn't erased it. And he, I found out later, had been taught by his coach, it's okay to write it down first, although that gets into another rule we're not doing today. So, <laughs> right. so, so there are many ways to, to work out if, if so. Yeah. I mean, basically, I mean, both people can't be right. If one player is saying that you touched that piece and the other player is saying, no, I didn't, uh, someone is unfortunately not being truthful, um, you know, in, in most cases. Uh, I guess you could legitimately, one player could think he didn't touch the piece uh, and the other one thought he did, um, you know, who knows. But, um, you know, if, if you, you know, there are ways to dig into it and methods of, of doing that and other evidence that you can use to, to see if this is, 
you know, to see if you really did touch the piece. Um, you know, you can usually tell when something's amiss. Um, and if you continuously get called over to the same board about touch move, well, you've either got a, you know, serial complainant or you've got someone who really is touching the pieces. So you should probably, you know, um, hover around that board a little bit more than you, you normally would, or, you know, have a tournament director at least, you know, keep somewhat of an eye uh, for these situations. But um, yeah, so, you know, it, you're, you're not gonna be able to please both parties in this instance. Uh, most rulings, you know, you can't please both parties anyway. Uh, but, you know, the, the general rule of thumb is if you can't prove it, just deny the claim. Uh, yeah, and that, that's what I do if there's no other evidence. And But you've covered it. You look for witnesses, you ask for demonstrations, and you look at score sheets, and they can shift the balance of who's got to prove it. Yep. So. All right. Let's move on to some more interesting stuff. So anyway, so what happens if you, you touch a piece and it, it has no legal move? Well, if, uh, if, if no piece touched has a legal move and no opponent's piece touched can be legally captured, then the player is free to make any legal move. So if if they do touch a piece, but it doesn't have, like say for instance, they move a piece uh, and it leaves a king in check and no matter where they move it, it leaves the king in check, uh, I guess they're not gonna be able to legally move that piece. You know, the, the, uh, so a really simple example of that would, a knight on c3 being pinned by a bishop on b4 to the king on e1, you know, they pick up that knight, it, it has no legal move. Uh, it can't possibly capture that bishop, so um, they're they're free to make any other legal move uh, with any piece that they they want. So um, you know it's this is fairly simple. And then uh, if piece touch cannot move, a director who believes a piece touched. Uh, uh, oh, so this is a director who believes a player touched a piece by accident uh, should not require the player to move that piece. Um, for example, a player's hand reaching across the board may inadvertently brush the top of a nearby king uh, or queen, or a player may hit a piece with an elbow. Um, so if you accidentally touch a piece, something that's not considered, um, it, the, it would, could be reasonably interpreted as the start of a move, I think is the wording, then it, it's an accidental touch. You know, if their sleeve brushes a piece or you know, they hit something on the way back or like it says here, their elbow uh, nudges a piece or anything along those lines, um, that you're not obligated to make them move that piece. That That is not something that could be reasonably interpreted as the start of a move. And therefore an accidental touch like that is, um, you know, it, it's so be it and they can, they can make any move they want still. Yeah, I, I can give an example. I've had uh, a kid knock down a piece like with their sleeve while moving another piece and they then went to set up the piece again that they accidentally <laughs> knocked down and didn't say adjust and i ruled that because it fell by accident that it was still an accidental touch when they adjusted it sure makes so. sense and then um a, an appearance of adjustment so sometimes it's clear that a player is adjusting even when that player improperly fails to say as you do but i adjust for instance, a player who uses one finger to slide a piece to the center of the square uh, is not acting in a manner usual to the beginning of a move, so uh, probably should not be required to move the piece. And he says probably should not. Uh, so, you know, the players who do this, you know, and it says here, players are warned, it's wise to announce one is adjusting in advance as a safeguard against being forced to make an unwanted move. So if they're just, you know, I've seen people just take their finger and nudge a piece over, just shuffle something over, um, you know, uh, it's uh, that adjustment of the pieces, even though they such, should say adjust or uh, jadu or, or something to those to those effects uh, before doing that. Uh, if they don't, then it you know you're probably still gonna not in that instance not make them move that piece. Uh, they've just got to be very 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 careful about doing that. Um, yeah, it, it's a bad it's a bad habit to be into, and probably one we should break them up at some stage. And, and I do make an attempt if that happens and I'm called to the board, I explain, you know, sometimes I got, well, I did say it. And the other person says, I didn't hear it. So I explained to the player who's adjusting, I said, you're not announcing it for yourself. You know, you're doing it, but you should say it loud enough so the person you're playing hears it. So I don't have to come over and settle this. And uh, usually one warning is enough and I don't have to come back. Yep. All right. And then, uh, oh, this is a fun one. Accidental release of peace. Um, so this is 
in the touch move rules. Um, so um, a, a player who deliberately touches a piece and then accidentally releases it on an unintended but legal square is required to leave it on that square. So a move, you know, a move um, determined when a player uh, moves a piece and then releases the piece on that square. Um, and this says if you accidentally, so if you're moving it and you drop the piece and it happens to drop onto a legal square, um, you should leave it on that legal square, uh, you know, because you've released the piece on that square. Uh, and this rule clearly says that. Um, I know of instances where this has happened. Uh, you know, uh, people have accidentally moved the piece to the square and they meant to move it one square forward uh, or, or something along those lines. Well, it, in that case, it's tough. Once you've released it on a square, um, you have to leave it there. Uh, and if your opponent makes that, um, you know, makes that claim, uh, I, you know, it, it should be upheld. So uh, uh, how often do you get called on this, Harold? Probably not too uh, much, but it does happen. Oh, no, not, not too much. I think I can count on my fingers uh, how many times I've been called, and that's out of 2,000 yeah. tournaments, so that's pretty rare. Right. So, and then let's uh, move on to a piece touched off the board. So this, this predominantly talks to, about pawn promotion, uh, but there is no penalty um, for uh, touching a piece that is off the board. So a player who advances a pawn uh, to the last rank and then touches a piece off the board is not obligated to promote the pawn to the piece touched until that piece touches the promotion square. So you can play with all the pieces on the side of the board as you want. Uh, of course, you might, you know, people might complain that you're disturbing the opponent or whatever, but, um, you know, um, yes, it's, uh, th there's no penalty for, for picking up a queen and not promoting to a queen uh, it, you know, because you suddenly realize before it touches a square that you're going to get stalemated uh, or something on those lines. Um, it doesn't matter what you touch off the board. What matters is when that piece touches the promotion square is when, when you're committed to, to using that piece to promote to. Um, yeah. I, I think and Ken Ballou is touching up uh, on here on a uh, something I think we were going to cover. I can't remember where we were going to cover it, Harold. But he's saying that a bad habit is players moving a piece, pressing the clock, and then adjusting the piece that they just moved. Um, yeah, so. Ken, Ken is correct on that. Your move is not considered completed when you leave a pawn on the eighth rank. You do need to remove the pawn and put the promoted piece on that square before you press the clock. Well, I think Ken is talking in general about someone moving a piece, uh, hitting the clock, and then adjusting that piece to put it back onto the middle of the square or something, you know. We, the, I think the idea is that... It, yeah, we, well, I think we're covering that later here. But okay, yeah. yep. So, yes. So touch move, touch move. you know, when you're adjusting pieces, you have to do it on your own time. So that's that's the key. And, uh, oh, let's let's get into the fun bit of castling. Uh, this is where the U.S. chess rules really uh, come into their forefront, I think, uh, in, in the playing world. So the, um, the, the rules, uh, 10i castling rules, the rules that are in effect, and, uh, uh, unless you announce something different, as we'll see in a minute, uh, is if you, uh, the king should be touched first, um, I guess, or the king of rooks simultaneously. But uh, if you move your king first uh, to castle, you're not going to have any issues. So if a player intended to castle touches the king first or king and rook at the same time, um, and then realizes that castling is illegal, uh, the player may choose to move. You know, player may choose either to move the king or to castle on the other side if legal. So and if the king can't legally move, then again you're allowed to make any move. So. Um, this basically if you castle and it's illegal you have to move that king um you know you, you don't you don't move the rook um but if you if the rook is touched first uh if a player intended to castle touches the rook first uh, and castling is not allowed so therefore it's not uh, uh yeah sorry no castling is not allowed and the player must remove the rook as required so if you move the rook first when castling with u.s chess rules the main u.s chess rules um, you can no longer move the king. So uh, you pick up that rook on h1, move it to f1. Um, if you then pick up the king on e1 and move it to g1, eh -eh. Um, you, you should be committed to playing the move rook f1. Um, and castling is not allowed because you touch the rook first. Uh, we'll see in a second that that's not always the case. But um, 
Yeah. So this this uh, again, a lot of these touch move rules relate to if the issue is illegal, because uh, if the movie is legal, then of course castling is allowed. They'll just castle. Uh, again, you know, if, assuming the rook uh, move of rook h1 to f1 is legal, um, then you know that is the move you would have to to make or a legal move with that rook. But if you can't make a legal move with that rook, uh, then you would be able to castle. <laughs> I, I don't know if there'll be a situation where you can't make a legal move with the h1 rook but still be able to castle. Uh, I'm not sure if that is, is possible at all. I'm sure someone can I don't think it is. Position, because but... <laughs> we know that at least two empty squares stand uh, between the king and the rook. So right. we know so... And, so, not to mention if the h1 has been moved or not. <laughs> so. Right. So, anyway, so uh, and then uh, the. Um, there is a variation in US chess rules uh, about rook touched first. So if a player intending to castle touches the rook first, um, there is no penalty except if castling is illegal. Uh, the player must move the rook if legal. Um, so basically this is saying, uh, if you use this variation, uh, and it says it should be announced at the start of a tournament. So if you use this variation, it's okay to allow castling by moving the rook first. Uh, and I think we'll come across a situation later where it's it's not okay, even if this variation is being announced. But we'll we'll cover that a little later on. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, do you prefer tournaments with the variation or without them, Harold? I much prefer the variation with allowing the rook first, especially if it's a children's tournament, because uh, it's rare that. A, <laughs> A child, I think, would move the rook and immediately move the king and not intend to castle. And uh, I do, uh, with the, them, if they ask, I tell them there's a reason you move the king first because, as you stated earlier, king, otherwise it's only one. So, yeah, I prefer this one, but I do encourage them to use the king first method. Yep. Okay. And then um, one of the other is when to claim touch move. So um, to claim the opponent has violated 10B, the touch move rule, or 10C, touching pieces of both colors, a player must do so before deliberately touching a piece. So if your opponent um, made a, a move uh, you know, uh, with a piece and then put that piece back and move something else, um, you basically have until you deliberately touch a piece to make the claim that they did that. Um, so you, you you know you don't have to do it immediately. Most players will do it immediately because uh, otherwise you're just wasting time. But anyway, you have until you uh, deliberately touch a piece to make that claim. Once you deliberately touch a piece, um, you can no longer make the touch move claim, whether they did violate it or not. Um, your your claim will just be rejected um, out of hand. So um, if you're going to make this claim, uh, make the claim before you deliberately touch a piece. Uh, otherwise, your claim should not be uh, should not be entertained. Uh, seems pretty clear. And that's it for covering the rules. The, um, I think touch move is pretty simple in overall. Um, I think most of the time, it's the issues we get with claims, uh, you know, and disputes that that make touch moves um, a little more difficult than it really should be. But the rule in itself is very sort of easy to understand. Um, I, th I think it's been tightened up a little bit. Um, you know, you take all the accidental stuff out the way. If someone picks up a piece, then you can reasonably interpret that as the start of a move, whether that was the piece they meant to move or not. Um, you know, and I think as long as you think along those lines, uh, you're good. Harold, anything further before we get into the trivia? Uh, no, I, I think you've covered everything and I've interjected a few things. Uh... Yep. I could probably talk for hours about touch move situation, <laughs> but you want to keep this show short, so I, I won't. <laughs> well, let's let's get into the trivia. So, um, let's. Uh, I know everyone everyone likes this bit, so I'm I'm going to uh, open up the trivia before anyone votes. Sorry, if you if you voted before the trivia, please vote again. So you've had a couple of seconds to read this uh, trivia question. Uh, in an event using variation ten i two, White moves his rook from h one to f one, pauses a few seconds then moves his king from e1 to g1. Black claims that white should have to move the rook. Uh, what would you do? Uh, and in all these situations, what would you do means what would you do as the tournament director? And we've had some votes in. 
and the, uh, the, the predominant answer right now is number one. Any more for any more? Uh, I know there's some people in the chat who don't normally join us here on the TD show. If you, if you think you know the answer to this, uh, having listened to the presentation, uh, please go ahead and type one, two, three, or four in the chat. We'll register your vote. So far, I think we've got three votes registered. Ken voted twice. Uh, you only counts one. Ken. We've got to take, take event. You've got to take your first answer, Ken. Uh, the chair of the elections committee. I, I don't know if he has that policy, but <laughs> <laughs> I guess let's keep voting out of uh, out of the TV show for now. All right, let's let's go ahead and close the poll off, and um, we'll announce the results there. <laughs> Uh, so what would you say the answer for this one is? Okay, the key phrase here is pauses a few seconds. Uh, when you're castling, even if you allow the rook to be moved first, it has to be done one after the other. And there's, the rule book isn't specific on what a few seconds is, but clearly the fact if you move your rook to F1, and then decide after that whether or not you want to move your kick to king to g1 you've kind of changed it from a rook move to castling and uh so the right answer here is number four yeah white must play rook f1 um yeah, yeah it, i mean i guess it depends on the few seconds right so i think anything more than instantaneously to me is is bad uh, and causes confusion uh if you're meaning to castle then then castle um, of course, yeah. I prefer you not to move the rook first, but um, you know, if you if you actually if you move the rook uh, and then wait a few seconds uh, and then go ahead and move the king, it, to me you you've you've lost that right to castle. So uh, yeah, you uh, should be deciding the castle before you touch your rook, even if you do the rook first method. And yeah. it certainly seems like you haven't decided if you're waiting after you release the rook. Uh, and for those that disagree with me in the chat, there is actually uh, one of the rules questions in the uh, exams by the TDCC that gives this exact same question, and the correct answer is number four. So if you want to argue with the TDCC, you you guys feel free to go ahead with that. <laughs> anyway, let's let's move on to uh, let's move on to question two. <laughs> So uh, let me open up the uh, poll here uh, and we'll start, start to, and I thought that was the easy question that we were going to get. So, so well done, Harold, for, for uh, coming away, <laughs> coming away from that. Um, so, uh, and Harold came up with all these questions, by the way. Well, sort of. <laughs> well, we worked on Harold, it together. I, yeah. <laughs> I gave you ideas that I, what I wanted to cover in the questions, but. Uh... Exactly. Yeah. You, you put in uh, a lot of the bad answers. <laughs> yeah, for those that were listening, uh, the, the answer to the previous question uh, is should be number four. So um, anyway, so question number two, black claims that white adjusted a couple of pieces, one white, one black, during black's turn and did not announce he was making an adjustment. White agrees he did what black, cl black claimed. Uh, what would you do? So remember, this is black's turn uh, but white decided to, <laughs> it's a good thing the TDCC is never wrong. Yeah, exactly. Um, so black, so this is black's turn and white's adjusting pieces on black's turn. Uh, white agrees that he did actually do that. Um, what would you do? So would you one, just one white, he must say, I adjust before I make such adjustments again. Uh, two, one white that he can only make adjustments on his own time. Uh, three, one white that he can only make adjustments on his own time and add two minutes to black's clock. Or would you fall one white that he can only make adjustments on his own time, add two minutes to black's clock and inform white that he must move or capture the piece he's touched when it's his turn since he did not announce that he was making an adjustment. That's quite the mouthful. But the more things we can add to it is uh, the better, I guess. Uh, so anyway, please go ahead and cast your vote. Uh, one, two, three or four. Uh, I know some of these are <laughs> four is harsh. Well, you know, hey, we're we're tournament directors. We're uh, and and by the way, if you if you type four is harsh, it does register a vote for four because four is in the wording that you wrote. So <laughs> so we now have one vote for four. So well, you you took the harsh route. 
um, and you know being a harsh uh, host of the TV show, uh, you know we'll we'll take that vote as 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 your answer. <laughs> I think that's Anand, right? Anand is the capital area chips. Welcome to the show. No, we, you know, it's scary having all these NTDs in the chat. Uh, Harold. <laughs> yep. So we've got five votes so far. I, I don't think one was an intentional vote, but uh, any more for any more? Does anyone want to guess the answers to this? All right. Aaron, let me go ahead and have you uh, put them out of their misery here. What would you What would you say? Okay, this can sometimes be a judgment call. Personally, I like number two. Uh, warn them that they can only adjust on their own time. But sometimes people will do annoying things at the worst time, like when somebody's in severe time pressure and there's nothing more annoying then you're in time pressure and you see your opponent's hand reaching for a piece across the board. So uh, if they do it repeatedly, or if I think they're doing it strategically to annoy their opponent, I might enforce number three here. Yeah. But yeah. my first choice is number two. Yeah, and I think we'd go ahead and give full credit for, for two or, or three, if you if you came up with two or three. Um, yeah, like Harold said, we, th we think it's a judgment call. If it's the first time they've ever done it and there's no... You know, both players still have an hour and a half on their clock or something like you know go with number two uh, if they keep continuously doing it and you keep getting complaints then then you got to start penalizing uh, white at some stage um, and, and working through that and probably your first thing is you know add two minutes to the opponent's clock um, at some stage so yeah good question and and good good simple answers uh, so i mean the thing to convey to white is that you should not be adjusting pieces on his opponent's time, that's for sure. So, uh, question number three. Uh, oh, we have a position. Uh, so let, let me go ahead and open the voting. So be careful if you chat, uh, type one, two, three, or four in the chat, uh, even as part of a sentence. Um, so in the following position, uh, hopefully you can all see that position. Um, white picks up his bishop on f3 and captures the knight on b6. Uh, black claims an illegal move. Uh, and White claims that he obviously intended to use the bishop on f2 and just picked up the wrong piece. Uh, so what would you do here? Uh, White, would you say one, White can play bishop takes b6 with the f2 bishop as he clearly intended to make that move. Two, White can play any capture on b6 as he touched the, the knight on b6 when he captured it. Uh, three, White can play any legal move with the f3 bishop as he touched that piece first. Or four, White can make any legal move. So go ahead and type your... Uh, answer in the chat there. Uh, one thing I will note uh, for you just briefly, and I think uh, I, you know, my chess skills were good enough to to make it so that I think no matter where he moved that f3 bishop, uh, it was not going to be anyway good. <laughs> Deliberately, of course. But come on, if he's capturing that knight on b6, he's obviously meaning to play a bishop to, on f2 takes b6. Um, you know, I think it's pretty obvious. <laughs> Could play queen takes knight. <laughs> well, you know, if you force him to capture the knight on b6, with, with you know, I guess he, he could take that with the queen if he wanted to. Uh, so majority of people are voting for, for one, um, uh, sorry, for three. Uh, we have one vote uh, for one. Um, that's okay. Um, so let's let's go ahead and close the voting off on this one. I think this one uh, should be right. So so someone in the chat is saying he thinks it's about intention. Um, uh, so I'll let Harold um, discuss this real quick, and we'll close the poll off. Uh, announce the votes there, and Harold, go ahead. And uh, what what would okay. you do in this instance? Yeah, the right answer here is number three. While you may not have, when you picked up the bishop on f3, intended to take the knight with it, you clearly did intend to pick up that bishop. And uh, it's the first piece you touched of the two. So that's why you have to move the bishop and not capture the knight. And yeah, maybe you only got bad choices with the bishop, but uh, it's the order that you touch them and the fact that you didn't touch it with the intent of adjusting, that right. you didn't pick it up with the intent of moving it. 
Yeah. So I mean, as we saw earlier, the rule was if you if you pick up a piece with the intention of, of you know something reasonably be interpreted as the start of a move, uh, so the bishop on f3 was picked up. Uh, you could reasonably interpret that as the start of a move, e even though you picked up the wrong piece. It, it doesn't matter in this case. So you would have to make him move that bishop on f3. Uh, but he can move it to any square he wants. So, uh, you know, that's some shining light, I guess, uh, on that for, for white. But anyway, so let's let's now move on to uh, position number four, uh, question number four here. Uh, let's, let's open up the uh, one, two, three, four. Uh, so in the following position, black pushes his pawn to c1, announces queen, and picks up the queen from the side of the board. Uh, before he can place the queen on the c1 square, white claims that it's stalemate. Uh, what would you do? Uh, so would you, one, uh, black must promote to a queen since he picked up that piece. Uh, two, black must promote to a queen since he announced queen. Uh, three, black can promote to any piece since he has not placed the piece on the queen in square. Or four, would you revert the position back to before the pawn move and black can make any legal move? So one, two, three, or four, please go ahead and type your answer in the chat. We have three votes for three so far. Uh, let's see if we get uh, a dissenting vote here somewhere along the line or whether everyone will just follow suit. <laughs> oh, sir, you cannot answer questions like that. <laughs> Now, now we have to be completely, uh, you know, unbiased. No matter who the two players are, uh, how do we know White didn't see the Queen of England walking? Yet? <laughs> right, I hear you. Anyway, uh, any more votes? Any more votes? <laughs> I got a question for you, Harold, really quickly. John Hartman is asking, how on earth you're able to play in tournaments you direct and still maintain an expert rating? Um, because I have a 2,000 floor. Okay. <laughs> Get a floor, John. <laughs> no, I, I briefly made master many years ago, and so I've got this floor. Uh, I'm in my senior years now, so I'm not playing as well as I used to, but I kind of got used to it building up as when I started running the club, I was only getting like 15 players. And next thing I know, I'm getting up close to a hundred and I just kept undoing it. So right. it wasn't all at once. All right, let's close the voting off here and uh, announce the, the results here. So we had a hundred percent of people voting for three. And the answer is Harold. It is number three. Yeah, and uh, right. the only thing I would say to the player who announced queen, just play the move. Don't say the move. <laughs> so. Right. Yes, and White clearly should have just held off on uh, waiting uh, with his glee before announcing Stillman. Yeah. Um, anyway, so, uh, and then last but not least, uh, question number five, and I think we saved the fun one to last. Uh, I guess we'll see that in a minute, uh, whether people feel the same way. So, um, yes, you are allowed to say something irrelevant when you make a move, I guess. Uh, so let's open up the voting. One, two, three, and four. <clears throat> and uh, the, the question is, white complains that black is continuously adjusting both sets of pieces. Um, however, he says that black always announces I adjust before making the adjustments, and he's always on his own time. So you watch the game for the next couple of moves and see that black is doing what white claims. What would you do? So it seems like every move, uh, black is saying I adjust, but mushing all the pieces around and, and adjusting them uh, as he wants uh, uh, every single move. Uh, so would you, one, black can no longer make any piece adjustments. You know, the black's had his share of uh, making those, uh, so let's stop him. Uh, two, black can only adjust his own pieces so long as he announces his intention to do so and does it on his own time. Uh, would you three black can continue to make adjustments to any other pieces so long as he announces his intention to do so and does it on his own time or would you four black must get a td to rule whether a piece adjustment is necessary before he adjusts any more pieces <laughs> mr reed we do not allow arguments for multiple answers here in this show we give definitive answers only 
boy boy dancer was uh he, he could make an album for two three or four <laughs> And I assume if a TD made any of those rulings um, and it was appealed to you, uh, it, it, you know, the TD's ruling would be upheld because you can make an argument for them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is the way. All right, so I'm going to give people more. This is a bit, a bit more complicated a question here, so we'll give you just 30 seconds more to answer this if you want to get in. Join. We've got we got answers. Majority of answers are four. Uh, we got one vote for three, uh, and uh, and I think law of averages uh, with Boyd uh, because he wanted to go for two, three, and four means his average is three, and there he's voting for three. So um, let's see. Anyone else? Anyone else? Any of the uh, newer mem uh, newer viewers that we've got tonight uh, watching the TV show? This is our fun part of the show. Sometimes there really is uh, multiple answers that, that can be right. And this is what we're about to find out, John. So John is asking, why is adjusting the opponent's pieces repeatedly allowed? Well, I don't know if you're asking that question just as a general question, uh, like why is why do the rules allow that? Or in, whether you're relating that to this specific instance, but yeah, general. Okay, and we got a vote for one. All right, so let's go ahead and close this one off. Uh, this is the last of the trivia for tonight. Uh, so uh, Harold, let me go ahead, ahead and have you uh, give what your thoughts are on what you feel the correct answer to this one is. Okay, uh, my first choice is number three here. Uh, they haven't technically broken any rules. However, uh, I think some players sometimes can just do it to be annoying. And sometimes a director has to come in and use their discretion to tell them, look, uh, you know, this piece has already been adjusted by you and it hasn't been moved since. It doesn't need to be readjusted. And uh, maybe you do have to resort to four if the player is just perceived as being maybe intentionally or maybe even unintentionally annoying because uh, it can be a problem trying to concentrate because you are allowed to use your opponent's time to think on it. Uh, certainly uh, I would reject one and two pretty much, uh, because you can adjust your opponent's pieces, uh, yep. but you know, if they're so not on you, you, you told me a funny story about these guys with the Knights. Yes. Uh, a few years ago at my Nassau chess club, I had two guys playing each other who didn't particularly like each other. And, uh, they, uh, one guy liked his Knights pointing towards the center files and the other guy liked his knights pointing towards the uh, eighth rank or the other side of the board. And they were constantly changing them and, uh, and adjusting and uh, arguing. And it caught, caught my attention. I stood over them and they, uh, they eventually the argument went away and they had continued the game with no more incidents. Had I been asked to intervene... I would have said, okay, black, you can point your knights whatever direction you want, and white, you can point yours wherever you want. Uh, because I think that would have been a nice in the middle uh, solution to the problem. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, if you can reach a compromise like that, then, uh, you know, go ahead and do it. And that, that seemed like a simple solution to. to yeah, it never got that solution. far. Yeah. But then I was criticized after the game. You were standing right there and you didn't do anything. Well, Yep. I technically wasn't asked, so I didn't. Yeah. All right. So, folks, that covers everything there is to know about Touch Move. Well, you know, the, at least the rules and should give you some guidance on um, how to um, go ahead and uh, deal with those should they uh, crop up in your tournaments from this point on. So I'd just like to finish by thanking our guest, Harold Stenzel. Uh, Harold, thank you very much for joining us tonight and uh, well, providing you. us with your expertise and uh, uh, experience in dealing with all of these claims. I know you're an avid viewer of the show as well. We we occasionally get you in the chat too, so it's nice to get you on the on the show. I uh, remember next week we'll actually have uh, Enrique Huerta, who is uh, always causing me issues in the chat, uh, and we're going to be talking about tie breaks. And by tie breaks, we mean um, tie breaks that 
award non-divisible prizes. So you come and learn about modified median and Solkov and cumulative and various other things too. So that will be at nine o'clock um, Eastern next Thursday. So thank you once again, Harold. And uh, stay safe, everyone, and have a good evening. Good night. Good night.